Okay, it's 6.30. We have a quorum. We'll call a planning board meeting to order. We are, we are being recorded, right, Drew? Yes, it says we are, yep. Okay. It says red at the top left corner. Okay. Um, let's see. I guess, for, first of all, we can uh, we'll get with Kent a second. We, we've got a couple of bills. We have the Gazette legal notice for um, ideal movers. That's going to be on the schedule. We just talked about a little bit before the meeting. Um, they are that the bill to the Gazette is three hundred ninety-three dollars and seventy-six cents. These legal notice costs are going out of sight quickly. Mm. Give me that again. Three ninety-three point seventy-six. That's incredible. I'm, I'm saying the same thing in these notices I've been saying now for oh, yeah, you're a right. year. And a year ago, the price for, for legal ad basically was around um, maybe 210, very between two, 205 and maybe 225. Now it's almost doubled, 393? Hmm. My gosh. Hmm. So anyways. I'll make a motion to pay. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And we have motion passes 4 0 with Mike being absent. And then uh, I need some stamps. Well, I guess stamps are 55 cents each. They're supposed to go up the end of uh, August. So I don't know what exactly, but uh, I'd like a motion to pay to buy three. Do you need these stamps, Bill? Uh, yeah, I probably should get a roll too. Okay. Let's, let me, let me, let's see. Uh, four, nine, five, five, 220. Okay. $220 for four rolls of 55 cent Four 100. Yeah. Four rolls of a hundred stamped at 55. So this, we need $220. I'll make a motion to pay 220 to the Postal Service. No, I will second. Okay, motion a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 4-0 with Mike being absent. Um, okay. That's all I have for invoices. Um, I guess we can get right into... Uh, The regulations and uh, Ken and stuff. Get you early tonight, Ken. Uh, yeah, this is uh, quite, the, you know, quite the meeting where it's, I get to talk to just the board today. Um, <laughs> well, good evening, board. So I think where we left off and, you know, I wasn't part of the conversation when you were putting this on your warrant um, while well, putting the bylaw in the warrant language. The, the warrant to the town meeting. Um, so I don't know what had happened with regards to the regulations. If you were still talking about um, construction costs, I know that there were some challenges in trying to pin down a number and pin down sources. Um, so at the very least, I thought that because this is a planning board regulation, presenting it as such um, and you know, providing the purpose, providing what the calculation looks like, and then how those funds are administered um, should be long um, in that. And this is coming from an example that was in- Excuse me just a second, Ken. Sure. Um, so maybe we should formally reopen the public hearing. Okay. As so that we can, and we'll talk with, with Ken. Okay. Do we need a motion to reopen or just? I think we'll just have to say we're reopening it. Okay. We're reopen, going to reopen the public hearing that we had on payment in lieu regulations um, for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Great. Um, so to continue that conversation, I, I mean, I don't know if I, I sent this. Um, yesterday evening late 
because I'm realizing that my um, email hasn't gone through. So if you send me anything, I probably didn't receive it yet. Um, but um, so what I did was, or what I'm suggesting the board look at, and um, Bill, could you um, give me permission to share my screen? Yeah. Yeah, I, if you sent something, I didn't get anything. What? I got it. I sent something. It was from my personal email. I sent it last night. Um, so if, if it, you didn't see anything from my PVPC email, because that email is, is, has been down for the past two and a half days. That, um, that was the one that included something from Danvers and some, and some place else on it. Yeah, I got that. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so with regards to that, I, thought that it probably at least to begin the conversation of how a regulation would look. You know, this is probably something similar that you have with your other regulations that hopefully in time we'll be able to organize in a way that all of them are in one place. But with regards to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund and your calculation of fee in lieu of units um, that you have in the bylaw, you address that you are creating a calculation by which an applicant would be required to um, calculate um, if he or she did not want to build on site affordable units. I, I did have some questions with regards to how in the past you may have administered this um, within your inclusionary zoning. Um, just because, you know, with regards to process, if there is a particular process you want to use, like going to the assessor's office to come up with that calculation or coming to the planning board to come up with that calculation, um, you know, it'd be good to just understand that so that if we need to address particular process steps, we can address it within these regulations. We, I, can, I can address that easily, Ken. We have not addressed that prior to this, we haven't had the need to address it. So there's been no inclusionary zoning units or payment of payment in lieu of units to the town. The right. only well, let, let, let's back up just a little bit. When the, when the inclusionary zoning was originally proposed and the original affordable housing trust fund was part of it, the, I believe it was the, uh, Finance Committee had real concerns about the way the Affordable Housing Trust Fund was worded. So the Affordable Housing Trust Fund was never part of the original inclusionary zoning and it was taken out. The actual creation of the trust fund, but the wording was left in. That was removed several years later because it wasn't being used. And it was reinserted last year, I think 2020. And we came up with the wording for that was when a trust fund was recreated and the wording was put back in and into the bylaw. And now we're working on the regulation for the payment in lieu portion. Okay. There was one senior housing that was created when the original bylaw existed with the wording for payment in lieu, but the trust fund wasn't there and so they were they put money aside it was the whole idea of a subdivision grandfathering yada 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 and it was a that created a mess that we realized we got to fix so that just snowballed all these other things that we've done since that time so in that in that senior housing situation uh the developer applied for a variance to allow him to make payments in lieu even though we didn't have a receptacle for it. And um, we worked out a formula based on his construction costs. There is only one other uh, eight lot subdivision that was created after inclusionary zoning was adopted that triggered inclusionary zoning. So, uh, and that's one where the developer may either um, um, which reminds me, we have to take that up too. The developer may either create a unit or make a payment in lieu, but um, um, that's still up in the air. 
It's still under construction. Correct. Okay. Which one is that? Colony Road. Road. Um, Road. Colony Road. Okay. So that eight, so that eight units sub or that eight lot subdivision inclusionary zoning would kick in. And I guess where there would be a requirement to have an inclusionary unit or a payment in lieu of that threshold hasn't yet been met. The payment so, in lieu has the payment in lieu has not been determined. That is correct. That's what we're working on. Okay. But so that's going to be a conversation that happens soon. Correct. Okay. Well, that's part of one of the reasons we're doing this is to get our ducks in a row because we do have someone out there who is interested in that as one of his options. Right. The um, senior housing went ahead on that variance ground. So that's not really a precedent, just it is what it is. So we okay. settled on a formula. So anything that you come up with here is, is uh, golden. So with regards to this, I think, you know, the thing to be mindful of is it, if affordable housing and in your inclusionary zoning bylaw relies on taking um, source material from Department of Housing and Community Development, as well as the um, percentages of area median income that are listed within the bylaw, you probably want to apply that here as well. And so um, in the examples that have been, you know, that I've shared with the board, and I probably have we've spoken about this and probably in your own research um, with regards to determining that fee it either has been presented as either a lump sum or has been presented through this calculation and the one the the one calculation that i'm finding the most um prevalent i guess in the in the examples that have this option have been to um, basically it would be the difference of what your market rate um, home, single family home in the town is, um, and then minus the, um, the home at the cost of those who are 70% or below area median income of the Springfield um, MSA, which is where Hadley Falls. Um, and there are examples that we can probably put into this document on how to calculate that. Um, but it would be the difference of those two things. Um, this one also, and I think that having had been in discussion with the board and in the various conversations, it looked like the board didn't necessarily want to go over a, a cost or over a certain amount. Um, so for the example, I think it was in um, Ipswich, which, to, Ipswich, to, Tewksbury, um, where this kind of presentation comes from, um, that town says that no, in no case shall the per unit fee of that affordable unit be um, less than, it should be more than 40,000 um, if there was a max that the town was looking at or, or the planning board or the affordable housing trust fund. Um, so again, I don't know if, you know, in, in the conversations within town or with, the, with this board at the moment, if you have the thought, any thoughts with regards to presenting it either way, or if there are some questions that may still need to be answered um, that could help, you know, draft this into a more final document. Can, can you give a, an example uh, by putting some real numbers in the 70%, what, and you have the, uh, the area median income. So just throw some numbers out so it'd be easier to understand. Sure. Let me. Um, I want to find that example. You got it. There wasn't. Yeah. One of those things you gave us did have an example, Ken. Yeah. Let me um, open that email back up. That was in my personal Gmail. And then I'm. 
I'd just like some clarification on why you'd want an upper limit instead of a lower limit. That is a lower limit. It's not an upper limit, Ken, okay. Mark. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. Is it Danvers? Tewksbury. So I'm going to share this. I think it was in Danvers. That you did them that there was a dollar figure. Okay. Well, so I, I'm opening this one up first, and I have my um my uh, browser sure open. But so this is the example in Tewksbury where okay. they calculated, and this was through the assessor's office, where the assessor just you know did this had had a number that they identified as number one above, which is this average price of qualified market sales of single family or condo units. Um, and then the DHCD guideline cost um, of 160,000. What's, what's the uh, DHCD? Uh, housing and Community Development. Okay. Yeah, that's the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, each, and so this is the Middlesex County median income because that's, you know, this particular community that falls under this jurisdiction. So I think, let me, let me open up another um, thing here. This is uh, DHCD. I remember when they were the EOCD. Yeah. Executive office. So this is for 2021. If you're to look at 70%. So some communities have 80%. Let's just say that you have 80%. Um, someone, uh, a family of four on, in, in, that have the 80% of area median income the, that limit would be $67,300. So a family of four with that income um, would qualify for these affordable units, as well as um, that would be the, the basis by which these numbers are calculated. Um, there's another document in here that does a good job of um, Oh, you didn't see that. Um, is it Danvers? Yeah, I don't think Danvers actually had an example in theirs, Ken. Theirs was more of, well, how many are re units were required? The, yeah, so... This one. There's a number. 10 units. Yeah. 12.5%. So, and so, you know, I think that I, again, you know, pursuing this particular calculation, is this something that the board this was presented, I think, initially when I gave you some examples, but the board then moved to the discussion of construction costs, which you also applied with regards to the um, senior housing example when you were looking at the going through the variance process. Um, does this make sense on, on how to maybe calculate it based on numbers that will change, not necessarily so much or be as fluid, However, um, it will change because your um, thresholds will change every year. Um, that's not to say, though, that you've already created this calculation or in this proposed document, a calculation is created based on the sources that are not going to change. The assessor will determine that every year or every time that this question comes up based on the best data that they have at the moment. So um, that's that's probably a good idea because yeah. the same thing happens when we try to determine the value of ag land under APR. 
Right. We do our transfer no, development rights. I, I like, I like not, I don't care for the Dansbury, Danvers exam bylaw. That's one is a bit too complicated for what we want to do. But I do like the uh, Tewksbury example. We just need to, uh, I think we do need to clarify the number of bedrooms and bathrooms so that we're kind of like the Tewksbury example, you know, three bedrooms or less and probably use something like one and a half baths because there's a lot of single family homes being built and sold in Hadley that are in the seven and $800,000 range. And that's just gonna skew the uh, donation just way out of sight. But Jim, is the catchment area, it's not just Hadley. Uh, I think Ken mentioned that it's the uh, greater Springfield area for median housing. That's where the that's where the number two number the that's where the, the income comes from. Right. Okay. But number one is based on the town's uh, values. So the, price, the house price is solely in Hadley. All right. Thank you. So so instead of excluding residences of four or more bedrooms, you may be well that would that would capture three bedroom. Yeah, I would say I mean, you can word it either way, less than four bedrooms or three or less. I mean, either way, it's, the number is the same and probably include like something like one and a half or two bathrooms. Most, most homes that are that size are not having more than one and a half or two bathrooms. Now, now let's just assume we take this as an example. When we discussed it with the E Street Commons, uh the the following of it it becomes very not expensive but almost very complicated in other words there has to be a a agency that will track that so when someone sells it remember when we went through that discussion we had the people form the the, the assessor's department knows can give you what the prices of homes that be are being sold for in Hadley because they get that from the registry of deeds, I believe. What gets complicated is the ownership and transfer of owned affordable homes. Correct. That, that's where the that has nothing to do with us and nothing to do with the town. That is purely upon the developer and the agent of the developer reselling and selling the house. But remember that they were, uh, even the attorney was saying it's a complicated issue and it's very difficult to track, keep track so, of. So that's where the payment in lieu comes in. We get, you're right, we, exactly. we, take, we get out of that loop. You're, you're right. right. So, yeah. you know, if they want to rent the house, it's far easier. But if they want to sell the house for ownership, you're absolutely right. It's, it's complex. Leave it at that. Okay. That's, that's why we want to. That's why it could be the, the payment in lieu. And, you know, right now, well, first of all, there's very few homes being built because the prices are so inflated right now. Um, but be it as it may, um, things are, you know, it's just that cycle. Things are high right now, overly inflated. Okay. I like what Ken's done. So, yeah, this, this, this is a floating that that was something I was hoping for something that was a floating. Um, so we don't have to go back and redo it every year or so. Um, so thank you for that. Did you did you like this language with regards to this because I think that I took this language because it was simpler. Um, but I think Jim brings up a great point with regards to the amount of bedrooms, you know, causing the, the housing um, in Hadley to, if for a single family, you know, to be not, you know, worthwhile with regards to calculating a, an average number. So um, I guess, you know, what I did was I found an example that was in um, Rhode Island, Portsmouth, Rhode, Rhode Island, that used this language, which was simplified that the assessor would derive this number from a multiple listing service. So that's real estate 
you know, numbers, but they also, as Jim pointed out, and we can refine this, um, is they get those numbers from the uh, registered, um, the deeds that come to the town when a house is sold. Um, so maybe it is worthwhile to utilize this language that Tuxbury has, um, maybe not necessarily including this. I don't know if that's important. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would put a time frame on so that okay. it will go back 20 years, but it's going to be longer than seven months because, I mean, sometimes you don't see a lot of homes sold in seven months. So I would say something like one through, I don't know, 24 months or something like that. So that it kind of evens out, if you would, the real peaks and valleys a little bit. You said well, how many months? One through one through twenty-four. Two years. Okay. Let me just share this other screen so you can see. And the one you have highlighted uh, talks about condominium residential units. So we probably should change that. Well, we can yeah, we can take the certain things out. I'm just going to um, share my other screen. Okay. I'm, I'm making those edits here. Um, but it only took Barry in there. <laughs> so this now, I think, captures. Can you make uh, that a little bigger, Ken? Excuse me? Can you, you make the screen larger? Bigger? Sure. That's better. Oh. So I think this actually probably needs to be 80 based on we use 80 up here. Yeah, maybe we should leave out the bathroom thing. That's that's true. Just leave a number of bedrooms. So you're fine with this? Yeah, yeah. Leave it like that. I mean, whether you say three or less or less than four, I mean, it means the same thing. Board of Health regulations, uh, do they allow five bedrooms? I don't think they do. I think it's uh, under a septic system. It's maximum of four. No, they allow more than four. They allow they allow more bedrooms provided the septic system can handle it. And that's based on how big your lot is and how the perk test is. So, okay, there's no hard and fast rule. Okay. Like, yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no five bedroom. You can't do it. Yeah. If you've got a big enough lot and your perk, your perk system passes, you're all set. Gotcha. Um, do we need any language for the unlikely someone's going to you no, know, rent it instead of sell it. I think so. I, I, well, well, if, we're, they're, we're, if, if they're going to rent it instead of selling it, then it is going to be restricted. Right. That this, falls into a different category. Okay. This okay. is just to deal with someone who wants to have their <clears throat> lots unrestricted. Okay. This is right. how they get out of plane in the um, yeah. affordable housing market. The, the affordable housing is going to build a single residential unit for each, according to how many total lots. And this is really on the owning of a building as opposed to the rental. I think I've asked Ken this before. Uh, once uh, it falls under the umbrella of affordable housing in a subdivision, uh, does the uh, prevailing wage law kick in? Um, you did ask this before, and I, I believe the answer is yes. So that, um, that really escalates the price. No, it, it, it does. I think anything related to monies or concepts that are outside of that have some sort of interaction with any federal or state guidelines does include, yeah, has to address prevailing wage. I was on a conversation with someone with regards to um, a community that is trying to get 
um, monies to um, to business owners to fix their storefronts. And the only way to do that, if they want um, community development block grants um, and go through that program, they have to use prevailing wages. So, you know, they have to hire those folks and, and pay them prevailing wages and everything is documented. Um, I can probably get some clarity with regards to how this is administered. Obviously, um, you're, you'd, I, I feel like the town would get the check and then it would go into your affordable housing trust fund because that's where it would go. And, you know, you'd have that money there. But when it came time to um, probably maneuver through any sort of process that requires a reporting, that type of information would need to be furnished um, to the community or to the administrator of the program. Um, that the, and that might be a good question for, for the, the properties that are included already in your housing inventory um, and, and particularly those um, senior um, units. So, so the, the senior, the senior units new, use no federal or state or town money to build okay. anything. Yeah, you're comparing in this section, section two, you're comparing uh, open market work. You know, what, what pl places are selling for and then what the, um, what, uh, what uh, would qualify for affordable, uh, which is, uh, you know, you, you're comparing two numbers. So uh, I, I don't see prevailing wage popping up into the calculation of a in lieu fee. Yeah, the prevailing wage may have, might be related to money coming out of the affordable housing trust fund. We'd have to investigate that. But yes, the, I think I think that <clears throat> yes that uh, that 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 seems more appropriate. That if you're going to be using money to develop affordable housing through your trust fund, through CPA, whatnot, um, those are the types of uh, questions that probably will come up. Is that yeah you know, yeah, that you probably need to um, explore that further. But I think Bill is right with regards to this calculation, it's a comparison of two numbers that are based on an assessment that the assessor will make on the mean price of market sale housing, market rate housing, um, and then a calculation that would be made based on those numbers that are in B. And, and then in C, we say in, in no case will it be less than, and I thought we had said 50, but Tewksbury was saying 40. Right? Yeah, th I mean, this can be changed, however okay. the board yeah. wants. Um, another example that you saw in Tewksbury is the, um, they had an administrative fee um, of $2,500 for costs to cover some administration. I don't know what that, how that would be handled. Um, you know, does the assessor doing that work, you know, does administrative fees apply? Um, that's a question too. I'm, I'm not sure what the administrative fee is for. We can always add it down a road, but in this case, they're gonna give us a check. We're gonna find out what the, I mean, the information from the assessor's office isn't that difficult to get. Yeah, I don't think. Um, and then it's purely plain and simple. This is what the the um, median income number is, and this is what the average selling price is. One subtract one from the other, and you got a you got a, a donation to the trust fund, and the money goes into the fund. And once it's in there, I mean, I don't know of any administrative costs down the road. Would there be attorney fees or something when we take it out? I guess it depends on how we use it. Well, well I, I think when we take it out, that's a whole nother story. And right now, I don't think, my opinion, I don't think we need an administrative fee. Well, remember the uh, 
the woman that came before our board, uh, Amy Feiden is on that board, uh, Northampton. They have an administrative fee just for keeping track. Keep track of what? Keeping track of the affordable housing unit so that it can be uh, listed as qualified under the uh, affordable housing 40B. Yeah, but that's got nothing to do with the it. Almost was like a real fund. estate fee. Yeah, but that's got nothing to do with the affordable housing trust fund. So, I mean, okay. Once the once the house goes into the into our number of affordable units, somebody has to keep track of it, and that's where we ran into difficulty with uh, the E Street Commons as well as when the people made the presentation to us uh, a couple of years ago. Somebody has to keep track of it. Well, I mean, I, I gave my opinion. Other board, if the other members yeah. feel differently, that's fine. Do you want no. an administrative fee and we can? That, that's, that's where we were talking, maybe Pioneer Valley would get into that business. Well, they're not gonna get involved in it. Yeah, we, we could add an administrative fee at this, at this stage for towards future use. Uh, Ken, could you put condominiums back in 2C? Okay. Because the um, senior housing overlay is now expressly subject to the, um, uh, to the, the bylaw, uh, the inclusionary bylaw and those are condos. Those are, we don't normally allow residential condos, but all of uh, the East Street Commons are condos. So do you think that how we, how we label it in 2A, single family residential units? Okay. Could be used here instead? Yes, single family residential units. Yeah, that, that would cover it. Good word, Smithing. What, <laughs> what were the calculation are um, with regards to your affordable housing trust fund when you went through the variance process to determine those numbers? Where were each of those units landing? How much per unit? were you collecting? $20,000. Okay. So there's obviously gonna be a little bit more than that um, because it, this is suggesting that the per unit fee shall be no less than 40,000, which may be appropriate. Housing costs are increasing, so. That probably was the general trajectory, and depending on when you approve that, that probably made more sense back then. Per unit fee, so that's per unit that you're not building. Correct. <clears throat> well, actually, let me let me rephrase that. It's not twenty thousand dollars. No, it was way more than that, Bill. Yeah, it's yeah. way more than that. He 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 based his number on a cost per, per normal unit is what he donated it. But it came out to be a cost on per affordable unit. It was probably in the order of 70 to 80,000. Okay. Because I think he was supposed to put in six or seven affordable units. <clears throat> And how much of a check have we gotten from them, Bill? 350, 400? Uh, it's, it's still coming in. Okay. Um, he, uh, we now have, uh, I, I think the amount that he turned over to us was 264,000 out of an estimated 350,000. Okay. And so how many, it was gonna be six units. I think it was six. So that's about uh, 55, 57. Yeah, it's about just under so 60, just under 60,000 a unit. Yeah. 
Yeah, you could just let's just round it up to sixty thousand. About fifty-eight thousand. <clears throat> okay. What I was uh, misremembering is he is paying it over time. He's doing twenty thousand per unit sold, rather oh. than coming up with the whole oh. amount up front. Gotcha. So he. We also have a. Uh, he also has a uh, transfer of development rights coming up when he hits a certain number of bedrooms sold. <clears throat> How does that work? Yeah, we were really sort of fumbling around trying to create something like this on the fly when we were talking with them about what would be a fair price. So. Um, I think whether this would have worked out, I, I don't want to even try to figure out what it, what it would have worked out at, but, uh, <clears throat> well, maybe it, it's worthwhile to change this number if, you know, it makes sense. Um, I, I think Mark brought a 50,000 that may be what the board thought. Um, I think we just passed that out. A while ago, I don't know how scientific it was. There's no way anybody's going to come up with a number right now less than about a hundred thousand. Actually, we probably could do a uh, yeah. Uh, let me just take a look at a uh, at what something in East Street Commons is selling for. They're selling for around 400. Plus. <clears throat> hey, Ken, in the opening paragraph of, of, two, of two there, I think it's the end of the second line going to the third line. It says family home. Do you want to say single family residential unit there as well? Yeah, that makes sense. Trying to follow the for a Hadley household of four earning eighty percent of the area median. Is it is it supposed to be earning less than eighty percent of the? For instance, uh, at at or below. I'm not sure if this is a completely fair. I just grabbed a sale. Uh, of a condo at East Street Commons that went for six thirty five five. Mm. That's the higher end. Most of and um, what did you figure the? Actually, it's probably too complex to try to do it on the fly here. But you said that uh, sixty sixty five thousand or so is the seventy percent or eighty percent. Was it was it eighty percent? Reopen that document. Let's see. I know Barry's originally original target for his senior housing complexes was three fifty to four twenty. Okay, I don't know if anyone else is talking. I am not hearing anyone. Oh, can you hear me now? No. You you lost your sound, Bill. Yeah, we Bill. We're all talking. We're all talking. Yeah, uh, we're singing the national anthem, Bill. <laughs> Okay, I guess we're having a glitch. I thought you felt comfortable that we weren't interrupting you. Yeah. You want us to, uh, well, I guess you can't hear us. You want us to talk in the chat? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> no. Okay. It's going to be on TV. Gotcha. So Bill did put in the chat. I'm not That's hearing what right. With Keith, with yeah. Okay. And I just wrote back. We hear you and each other. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Don't know what happened. Maybe in the future we need to put that. What 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 do they call it on on the TV? The subtitles or something? Ah, I don't know if that'll work. <laughs> that that'd be ADA uh, approved. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I hit some hit a button on my keyboard or. Uh... Do, do you hear us now? Oh, I hear you now. Okay. Or your bandwidth just hit a blip. That could be too. Yeah. Um, right. Anyways, Bill, you said about the the, the, your, the unit you saw cost six thirty five or something like that. Barry's original goal was to have the units targeted between three fifty and four twenty, but then depending what people want to add on, they become obviously more expensive. Right. But that does work into the formula because that was the deed consideration. Right. Or would work into the formula going forward, but okay, I, I I'll just set that aside. Um, um. Now, one one of the things that we we don't I wouldn't suggest we do it right now, but maybe what we want to do is put something in there that if somebody, let's say most homes are selling for three hundred, somebody comes along with their three bedroom. Home that sells for something like seven or eight hundred. That's going to blow the because we're not talking a lot of homes being sold in the town of Hadley either. That's going to blow this price average completely out of the water and make it a ridiculous donation. So we may want to put something in down the road that would exclude something like that. You could exclude the high and the low. Right, because someone's going to be selling a, uh, a pretty shabby building, too. Yeah, and sometimes you may find a home being sold to a son or daughter or relative for $100. Right, right. <clears throat> and that's going to well, obviously... Maybe, maybe the next uh, developer that comes in that... Uh, qualifies for a, a low income or moderate income housing, we should ask them to build one to see what that alternative would look like. And it's supposed to look relatively comparable to the ones that are adjacent to it. Well, I, what you may find out is depending on how these formulas work out, some developers may find out it's less expensive to build. Perhaps, correct. Or build, not necessarily in the same development, but re rehabilitate a house elsewhere in town. That's, 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 that's that, an that, is a, that is an option in the bylaw. It is an option, correct. Yeah. Now, before we think this too much, let's just kind of go, I mean, it's a regulation. It's not going to take a town meeting to change it. And if, I'm afraid if we get, if we think too much of it, we're going to make it insanely crazy. Exactly. And so let's kind of go with what we have right in front of us. I mean, maybe make a few little minor, if you wanted some more minor edit, but let's not make it too, well, forget this, add this, don't do this. Let's just kind of see how it comes out. We do have a minimum, maybe the minimum donation should be um, six, let, let's Let's change the minimum donation, Ken, to sixty thousand. That way, if we got a bunch of homes that are given to kids, their family for for a hundred bucks, hmm. it's not going to blow that donation right. too low. Right, and that's and that's a proper number inflated from this from the one sample we have 
from berries. That is correct. Yeah. And it, it is a sizable donation, no matter how you slice it. It's it's an incentive to build units, and I think that's what the law is there for. So right, I think we're doing right. Yeah. So does this does this option automatically become open to them? So when they are developing housing and the inclusionary zoning kicks in, your discussion with them would be your how to address inclusionary zoning. Do they do, does the board, I guess, is that the first conversation that the board has with regards to that? Do they say where, you know, are you building it on site? Um, we should, and should there be an advocacy for that, that you build on site? And then if not, and they've, met you know any sort of determination that the board may have considered to suggest that it doesn't make sense to build on site and instead you know it will go into the housing trust fund i guess you know it it, it the ability to payment in lieu of is i think is one of those ideas that shouldn't necessarily be the first you know idea with regards to inclusionary zoning and how you meet that right um so I, I guess that's a, you know, that's a policy for the board. Um, experience is going, is, we'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll predict this, Ken. Experience with the transfer of development rights will, says that most developers are going to opt for the cash donation. Hmm. Transfer development rights gives you several options for transfer development right thing. One of them is, to, is for the developer to go out and negotiate with a farmer to do something. Nobody has ever tried that. Most develop, every single developer that has used TDR has come in with a cash donation, period. They don't want to get involved in the negotiations with, with a third or fourth party. They just want, here's the money, we're done, do it, do it. So who's been actually negotiating with the farmers? Has that been like the Kestrel Fund or the ConCom or somebody? Or money goes in, the money goes into the ConCom Fund. Yeah, it goes into a special that, TDR fund and that TDR that fund is the, used to buy APR rights and stuff like that. That covers the town, town usually covers most of the town share for the 5% necessary to kick in for APR purchase. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen it when we've voted on APR expenditures. I, I just wondered who was at the, who was out there negotiating those, or if, I mean, I, I'm not guessing that the farmer comes in and says, I'd like to sell the, well, I, maybe they do. Well, the, the, typically the way APR works, kid, is the farmer comes in and says, I want to sell my APR rights. Oh, okay. And that goes to the APR group, for lack of a better term, in the state, and then they negotiate back and forth through evaluations, estimations, appraisals, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, come up with a number. And the farmer can say, I accept it or I don't. Mm. And if it's accepted, then it goes to town meeting and et cetera. So Kestrel sometimes acts as an intermediary. What Kestrel can offer is that for the right parcel, they can act faster than the state can. If you were to begin your application today, it might be 2023 before you fit into the state program. And when you have prime farmland and you have a developer waving money around, the only way to um, protect it is to have someone like Kestrel, one of the land trusts, jump in to basically provide bridge financing for the stake. Um, so in, in those circumstances, you sell your development rights to Kestrel, who borrows money from sources available to land funds and then Kestrel 
uh, sells when the state is ready, Kestrel transfers the development rights to the state. I see. God bless Alan. It is, a, it, is, it is a complicated process, Mark. It's not a, mm. it's not simple. <laughs> no. Like anything it's, with the state. Right. It, and Mark, you'll get some, uh, some requests through the uh, CPA Community Preservation Act money mm. to supplement what the uh, CONCOM doesn't have if they don't have enough in their kitty. Right. Yeah, I've seen those. Yeah. Okay. Um, that looks good, Ken. Thank you. Sure. So the one piece that I wonder if you could look into, okay. I'm sure we can figure out 2A, the average price. Um, in fact, maybe we can even ask, um, well, we just pick a number. Um, uh, maybe call it 350 or something like that, uh, just to see how the numbers work. But I don't, what I don't know is how to, um, how to figure out what is available at a purchase cost no more than 30% of 65,000. Uh, I'm not sure what goes into that. Let's see. And that's going to be dependent on interest rates and down payments and a few other things I imagine. Yeah, I feel like I found a resource that I think spells out how to come to that number. Um, and I, as we've been talking, I've been trying to find where I found that. And, and um, don't kill yourself right now, Ken. We don't need that number right. We don't need that source right now. Okay. But, you know, over the next couple of weeks, if you would try to locate yeah. it so that we can find it ourselves easily. Because then we can, we can run, um, you know, a couple of, uh, we could, we can create our own, uh, ask the assessor for what, what's the average price. He, he keeps track of things like that because people are always asking him what my tax rate is going to be. And so for the okay. average house, it's this, that, or the other thing. Um, so we, we can get that piece from the assessor and if you can get us what goes into that 30%, um, and then we can just run a sample calculation to be sure that we're not completely out of whack here. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What I'll do is I'll um, save this and, and send this to the board. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I will um, take a look into that. I know that I bookmarked all of these pages as I was trying to find the best example for this type of language um, and how it would be presented in a, you know, uh, a rules and regulations based on how typically they're presented. Um, so I'll navigate through those links and um, okay. try to find that out for and, and send something to you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so would it be appropriate to move to continue this hearing until uh, September 7th? Yes. September already, my goodness. Can you make okay. that date, Ken? Yeah. Okay. When you, you're usually scheduled meetings that I right, have right. those already blocked. Okay. Ken, uh, this is Joe Zagrodnik here. Just, uh, I know you've moved into uh, 
Happy Valley here, but uh, some of your contacts that uh, I'm interested how the Charlton case with that marijuana buying, you know, they're buying the apple orchard to convert it into a uh -huh. marijuana industrial park, basically, how uh, it, it's going to play out after the Supreme Judicial Court ruling. That I... It, it, I mean, anytime I feel like with regards to any sort of land court cases, obviously all eyes are on those. And, you know, I've, I haven't had my share of land use cases um, in that I probably never want to be um, okay. part of that. Um, but I know that some of the communities with regards on how they're ad addressed by the land, um, by the courts, specifically some communities in the Valley that have had their solar bylaws challenged. Um, you know, I think there there is this notion that the applicant will end up getting their way, um, getting, you know, going through, they would have to go through another process with the planning board, but now the planning board has very specific, a uh, very specific function is based on the conversations that and the, the findings that the court has already, I feel, has already landed on. And so um, with regards to Charlton, and I, I haven't, you probably know a little bit more than me other than, you know, when I was a, a planner in the uh, adjacent town, I just know that there were a lot of issues with regards to how it was being presented to the community and all of the issues on, you know, even writing an agenda. Um, for both the planning board and for the town when they were going through the host community agreement um, yeah. process. Bill, Bill did send us the, uh, what, what was it, Bill? That was the ruling by the Supreme Judicial Court and all the, the language in there? I believe so. That, that, was, that, that was very informative, so thank you. All right, forget it. I don't want to put any burden on you. But more so i there's motion to uh continue to september 7th and i would second that. motion oh, to second that charlton case was from the appeals court okay so there is one more step oh. motion motion a second to continue the discussion on inclusionary regulations, et cetera, to September 7th. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 4-0 with Mike absent. Any more business? I got well, just a question for you, Bill. When we when I send the bills in, the bill to the Gazette goes to the accountant. Did the stamp request for a check go to the treasurer? Um, Do you know? I don't know off the top of my head, um, but um, I'll tell you what, put it, yeah, send it to the accountant um, for now. Okay. If that's not right, we'll. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put a request in there. Is she the right person yeah. for this? Because you're basically asking for a check, just like a check to the postal service. It says to the, normally the checks come through Postmaster, U.S. Postmaster for stamps. Yeah. So, so I think it should follow the same procedure. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ken. Thank sure. you. Anything else? Yes, I have one more thing. Uh, okay. I'm not participating in this decision, but fortunately there are three of you there. Uh, you need to release two more lots from Colony Estates. Leaving us with how many? Two. Uh, we actually had released an extra one, but uh, that deal fell through and the release was never recorded. Okay. So, so um, that will be uh, shredded. This is the one for... Uh... Col Colony drives off Shattuck. Yeah, that's the latest one. That's yes. not the Burkum. That's, that's the other one, right? Right, that's the other one. Wischkiewicz is a pro former property. Yeah. Okay. Would you say Jelinas or something? Yes. Yeah. Entertain a motion. I will make a motion to release lots. What are the numbers, Bill? Do we have a number? Uh, one and seven. One and seven on Colony Drive. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. 
because of the way we're doing, let's do a roll call vote. Mr. Zagrodnik? Aye. Maximoski, aye. Mr. Dunn? Aye. Mr. Dwyer? Abstain. And Mr. Sarzinski is absent. absent. So the motion passes three, zero, two abstain or absent. Okay. Do you need one of us to sign those, Bill, or not? Yeah, I'll give Joe a chance to cut stop by at some point or I'll stop by and bring him um okay the release That's is, there a, is there a lot plan that would show what lots one and seven are is that important yes and which ones do we have left in reserve uh let me show you And are you in a butter to that? No. Okay. Just avoiding any COI. Okay, so let me... So, uh, lot five and lot eight remain in covenant. Two, two, four, six, one, three, and seven will be freed for construction. Look at all those Zagrodnik squares. Uh -huh. They were very creative once upon a time, Mark. Oh yeah, well, you've kept them honest. You're a good man, mm -hmm. Mr. Z. <laughs> There's no truth, no truth to the rumor that people put my head on a piece of paper and traced it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the old, I mean, necessity is the mother of invention, Mark. You yeah. know that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we got a few bylaws that were proactive. But unfortunately, a lot of them ended up being reactive because of creativity. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've always said that laws are like building fences. They keep the honest people in, but w once you build a fence, the other people are going to find a way over, around, or under it. So, or cut it, or go through it. You're right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, anybody have anything else? Negative. Nothing else, Bill. I have nothing else. Okay. Move with your. <laughs> Motion. Do you have a second? I will second Joe's motion. Motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting is history. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Ken. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Yeah. Good night, good night all. Good night.